Our next guest used to work for NASA and Xbox, now a New York Times bestselling author. He's Boyd Morrison, up next. So welcome to episode two of the Ozzy Osbourne Show. I'm your host, William J. Bruce III, and with me on the phone is Boyd Morrison. Boyd, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'll just start with, you had an interesting ar- arrangement with your wife um, regarding, you know, the her going to school and, you know, the exchange. Can you can you explain that for us? Yeah, well, I, I started writing back in the 90s. I wrote a book, um, but I, I couldn't get it published. And, and it was around that time that my wife decided that she wanted to go to med school. So... Uh, writing and working at the same time was a, a challenge, so I made a deal with my wife, and uh, um, I would put her through nine years of pre-med, med school, and residency, and then when she was a working doctor, I would get to quit my job and try to uh, be a full-time writer with the goal of getting published within nine years. And uh, I, I did exactly that when she became a doctor, I quit my job at Microsoft and uh, became a full-time writer, and uh, it only took me five years to get published. Nice, nice. But you, you had, like, yours wasn't a, a regular job that you were working. Uh, you're at NASA. Um, so, okay, I, I have to ask, what's it like to, to ride the KC-135, a.k.a. the Vomit Comet? It's, it's a blast, although uh, I would say from, I, I flew it on three times, and in my experience, about half the people who fly actually vomit, which definitely, so it definitely deserves the nickname Vomit Comet. Um, luckily, I was not one of those people, so I was very happy to say I got through all three flights without uh, throwing up, but um, <laughs> it's, it's a blast. I mean, it's, it's, it's exactly as much fun as, as you think it would be. Um, just and and we would uh, fly forty parabolas, and a parabola is each time it goes up and down, um, and you get about twenty five seconds of weightlessness each time. And um, so we fly about forty of those per flight, and usually our experiments are done after about thirty five or thirty six parabolas. So for the last four or five, we get to just play around, and do somersaults in zero gravity. And it's a blast. Loved it. That's cool. Um, so, what was your your role at NASA? I was in the. Uh, I was working on the Space Station Freedom Project, um, working on um, human factors and ergonomics uh, for the astronauts. Um, so, one of the things I worked on was uh, they were in the design of the space station. They were trying to decide where to put the limited number of windows that they could have. On space station to maximize viewing of the Earth, viewing of the space station itself so that they could do maintenance, uh, either with extravehicular activities with the astronauts or with the robotic arm. And so we did a lot of simulations of the, uh, of the space station to, to optimize the location of them. Okay. And so then you end up leaving NASA uh, to go work from Microsoft and Xbox? Uh, it was a little more roundabout than that. I, okay. um, I left NASA to get a master's and PhD in um, industrial engineering with a specialization in ergonomics. And then I worked for RCA for um, about five years working on television and satellite system electronic program guides and came away with about 15 patents, I think. Really? On the display of information in a program guide. And then worked at a small internet firm for a couple of years during the uh, dot-com boom. And then, of course, it went bust. And so I, I got a job at Microsoft working in the Xbox Games Group. And so I worked on, on usability of, of games like Flight Simulator and Forza Motorsport. <laughs> All right. So you have two jobs where you have, and you get to do a lot of playing. Like I understand you, you tested the games, like playing them yourself. 
Yeah, that was a big part of my job because in designing the um, the test, what we did was we would bring in consumers uh, to play the games, and we would either watch them playing the games, find out where they had problems navigating or setting up the game, and the, and the other type was uh, actual play testing, where we would bring in about 25 people to play an hour of the game, and then we would give them about 150 questions in a questionnaire to find out. Um, how much they enjoyed the game, where it was too hard, where it was too easy, and uh, we would collect all that data and give it back to the game designers so that they could uh, improve the game before it came out. And so a big, big part of my job was actually playing the game so I could set up these tests. And when I was there, we would bring in approximately 10,000 consumers a year for these play tests. Oh. Um, so do you still game? Not as much as I used to. Um, it's it, the the writing has taken up a lot more of my time, um, so uh, I I don't get to play as much as I I want to. Um, partly because games now are just so elaborate; they take so much time, and I, I just have trouble dedicating you know twenty hours to playing video game. For sure, for sure. Okay, speaking of, of writing, so. So you end up leaving all, all of this um, at the end of your the, the nine years that you had this commitment uh, situation. I, you know, I have to ask, you know, was it hard to sort of walk away from, from that world? And, and was there like, do people have, uh, you know, did people share their opinions about, you know, not chasing your dreams and, and stuff of that sort? Yeah, it, it's funny. Um well, first of all, I I don't regret for a minute leaving for um, sure the, the, the business world to do this. It, it's been a great ride, and and it was definitely a risk because you know I left to earn no money <laughs> for five <laughs> years while I was trying to break into publishing. Um, but luckily, I I was able to uh, have a spouse who could support me during that time. Um, and, and when I was when I announced I was leaving Microsoft to pursue this dream, um, I, I really thought there would be a lot of people who would say, "Oh, you're crazy for leaving this good job and and taking this risk where you don't know if you'll ever make any money at it." <clears throat> and actually, the opposite happened. I I didn't have one person say that, and in fact, I had many many people say, "I am so jealous of you that you're getting to leave and pursue your dream." Wow. Um, so, so I had a lot of support actually from from people at Microsoft who thought it was great that I was doing. This. Wow. Now, what about like friends and family? Was was it a different story with them, or was it sort of the same? Uh no. I, I all my family and friends were very supportive. They wow. they were. I think they didn't really know how it would go, um, but they were supportive of me trying it, and certainly having a spouse who. Um, who is uh, very supportive, helped that a lot. She she had read my first book and um, thought it was good enough to publish. In fact, she she was a little upset with me that I gave up trying to publish it so so quickly. And she she determined that it would be a published book someday, and it actually is now. It's been uh, published not only in in the U.S. but in the U.K. and Germany and. Uh, so she, she made that happen, but um, you know, it's. Uh, I think it would be very difficult to to take that kind of risk and challenge without a, a wife or a spouse who is, you know, one hundred percent behind it. So she she really made a difference for that. Wow, that, that's a, a you got, you have such a nice story there, really nice story. Um. When and how did you discover your, your passion for writing? Not so much later in life. You know, I, I hear about a lot of writers who say, oh, yeah, I've wanted to write since I was seven years old. I, I That, it wasn't me. Um, I've always loved reading. Um, and I've been a big thriller fan, um, you know, ever since I read Raised the Titanic by Clive Kessler back in the early 80s. And um, so, you know, I, I just vacuumed up books, uh, all, all kinds, thrillers, science fiction, 
um, mysteries, uh, and uh, but it never occurred to me that I could write my own until I took a I, I was doing my PhD research and uh, I was I was uh, working in Rochester, New York for Kodak uh, because they were the ones sponsoring my research at the time and. Uh, I didn't really know anybody there, and I didn't have anything to do at night, so my wife suggested that I take a science fiction writing course that was being uh, taught by a uh, Hugo Award-winning uh, science fiction writer named Nancy Kreft. Really? And so I took the class, and I I wrote a terrible short story for it, uh, but it, it got me interested in, in the process, and I thought, well, maybe writing a thriller uh, a novel-length thriller would be more my speed, and so I started writing that, strangely enough, while I was doing my dissertation, and uh, that's the one I, I finished. And uh, I thought, well, I, I think I could do this for a living someday, so that's when my wife and I made the deal. Wow. Wow, I didn't know about that part. That was really cool. Um, now, you've written, you've gone on to actually write eight books so far, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, book on number nine right now. Okay. Um I got, I got a question. When you're when you're writing a book and you get like uh you get to the end of the book, uh what what what's your feeling? Is it is it like a, a sense of relief that the book is done or is it you wish it could continue? <laughs> no, it's definitely the first part. Um, <laughs> I, I am Relieved it's done. Um, it, it re- especially when I get to the end of the book, I'm just writing really, um, really fast and really hard. And so I, when it's done, I, I feel I feel good about it. Uh, usually, for every book I've done so far, I've been very happy with where it's ended up. Right. Uh, it's usually in the middle that I hate it. <laughs> I think it's not going to work, and I don't know how I did this in the past, but. You know, I motor through it and get it done. And then when I get to the end, it's a relief because it turned out to be actually what I think is a decent book. So um, I think for most authors, they are always looking at what the next thing they're going to be able to get to do. That's always more appealing than, than the one they are, are working on now. Um, so, or at least for me, that, that is the, the case. Um, and, and you, you know, you spend a year with a book. So, um, yeah, I think, and you read it so many times that, in a way, you're kind of sick of it because <laughs> you know exactly what's happening, and, and all you see are the little technical flaws, and um, you know it's, it's not like the experience of reading a book the first time and um, you know getting all those surprises and twists and stuff you didn't see coming. Um, you know, I know exactly what's in there, and so I think at the end, I'm I'm very happy to move on to the next thing. But I'm usually happy with with the results of what I produce. That's cool. Um, so now, when because you've you've worked on a, a few series, um, how do you know when it's the end of a, a book versus the end of a series? Um, uh, I don't know if you ever know when the end of a series is. I think I think if you're doing a trilogy with a beginning, middle, and end, that's okay. much easier. Yeah. Um, but an ongoing series that doesn't really have an end, um, you know, it's it just, when, you know, sometimes it's market forces, sometimes it's just you are, don't have any more ideas for stories in that series. Um, but I don't think it really ends. Um, so I haven't done a, a for example, my, my own series, the Tyler yeah. Locke series. I've done four books in that series, but yeah. it's not really ended. Um, I can always go back to it at some point and, and do more stories if I come up with something really cool for it. Um, but, you know, I, I may not either, so I, I don't really know. Um, but there's certainly nothing keeping me from um, story-wise from doing that. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, how did your publishing deal come about? Um, very roundabout. I, I uh, uh, so I, I found an agent with my third book, which is The Ark, and um, my agent really liked it, and uh, we, we 
we did some revisions on it, and then she submitted it to 26 New York publishers, and we got what I call rave rejections. Okay. Which they, they thought the writing was great, and they liked the story and the characters, but they just couldn't figure out how to sell it in a crowded thriller market. So uh, after we got the 26th rejection, we were pretty much out at that time of people to submit it to. Submit it to. And so I, um, it was around the time the Kindle 2 came out, and Amazon started their Kindle digital publishing system. And I said to my agent, well, what if I put um, The Ark and my other two books that I had written up on the Kindle and sell them for 99 cents? And she said, yeah, I might as well. It's, you know, nothing to lose. And so um, I did that, and uh, it was about me and four other people who were self-publishing at the time. I mean, it was right at the beginning. Yeah. And within a couple of months, all three of my books were in the top 150 on the Amazon store. Which wow. was shocking at the time because yeah. nobody really knew if self publishing, you could make any kind of money at it. And so, you know, which is kind of laughable now, but back then nobody had any idea. And, um, within three months, you know, they were, they were top ranked on the store and I had sold far more than anybody else had at the time. And, uh, that was the time when Simon & Schuster came calling and said they really liked the art and wanted to publish it. So um, I got a four-book deal, including the three books that I had put on, on Amazon. Very nice. And as far as we know, I'm the first self-published author to get a, a publishing deal from one of the big five wow. publishers. Wow. Um, and and after I got the deal with Simon & Schuster, then, then foreign publishers came along and... Uh, and the arc is now in 22 languages. Wow. Okay, I didn't know about that. Wow. That's cool. Um, now, you have a film rights agent, too, right? I do. Um, it's through my literary agent. Are there... Uh, nothing Nothing on the uh, uh, horizon right now as far as movie deals. Okay. Okay, so anyway, so I'll, I'll jump around, um, jump ahead. Sure. Um, so... You got to work, you know, or you're working with uh, Clive Custer. Um, how did that come about? Well, um, I, I he uh, was looking for a new writer to co-write the Oregon File series with because his uh, previous author left to go back to writing his own books. Okay, um, and that was Jack DeBrule, and um, he. Uh, lives in Phoenix and uh, knows uh, goes to the Poison Pen, which is a big mystery and thriller store there. And uh, I had happened to go through there on the book tour for The Ark. Okay. So the owner knew me. And when he came in asking for a recommendation for you know, a new author that he might uh, want to work with, she recommended a couple of my books. And so, unbeknownst to me, he read you know, my books, and he loved them and, and contacted my agent, and then I get a call from my agent one day about three years ago, and she says, uh, what would you think about writing with Clive Cussler? <laughs> and I said, sure, that would be awesome. And she said, okay, he's going to call you in two minutes. Wow. <laughs> okay. And uh, he called me up and said, hey, Boyd, I loved your books, and I uh, wanted to know if you write want to write the Organ Files series with me, and I said, that would be awesome. Mr. Cussler, of course, now I call him Clive, but, um, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, so he said, okay, uh, we'll bring you down here in a couple of weeks and get started. And that was literally the extent of the phone call. And, uh, sure enough, two weeks later, I'm, I'm sitting in his office and we're brainstorming ideas for, uh, what became Piranha. Wow. Wow. And now he was like your, like one of your inspirations, right? For getting into that genres what I right yeah I, uh, like I said I raised the Titanic was the book that got me interested in thrillers in the first place and I I had mentioned that in in other interviews yeah. long before I started working with Clive so wow you know, it, it's not, I don't say that just because I'm working with him now I mean yeah. he really did wow so you I had that you no know, pun intended uh, that that, that uh, interest in me so like it, it must have been a little nervous eh when you first uh Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like I said, it was, you know, Mr. Cutsler, and he's like, come on, just call me Clive. 
Wow. Um, he's very laid back and easy to work with. And, you know, it's been a dream working with him. Um, you know, but, um, before I started working with him, a lot of, you know, like on, online reviewers had mentioned, wow, if you like Clive Custis books, you like Boyd Morrison's or, um, you know, he really, his writing really mi- reminds me of Clive Custler. So, wow. I, that, I, I was a pretty good fit. Yeah. For, yeah, for sure. Be. But basically I had learned from reading his books for, for 30 years. Wow. Um, so, you know, I, there's, I wasn't trying to do an homage to Clive Kutzler. I was, that's who I learned about, you know, writing a, a great thriller from. So, so when I started working with him, it really wasn't much of a transition to, uh, writing in, in the style of Clive Kutzler because I was already doing it. Wow. Um, how is it different, like, to, to co-write a novel versus, you know, doing it, like, on, on your own? Um, well, the way we work is I go down to his house for a couple of days, and we brainstorm the, the high-level plot, and then I come back here, um, and uh, I write 100 pages, and I send them to him, and he revises it and sends it back to me, and, um, and we do that until the book's done. Um, when I'm writing on my own, I usually I usually blast through the first draft all the way through before I even think about going back and rewriting. But um, you know, with, when working with Clive, I have to, to make sure that um, what I send him makes sense. <laughs> A lot of times, if I'm going through the first draft on my own all the way through, a lot of times stuff has changed so much by the end of the book that the first hundred pages don't make sense anymore. And that's when I go back and revise uh, those pages and fit with the rest of the story. But, but I can't do that when I'm uh, collaborating because then it, it would have an idea, a good sense of, of what I'm doing in the story. So that's, that's probably the biggest difference. Yeah. Um, okay. So you're, um, you're like a, a, a big stickler on, on details, you know, with your, your background. Um, like, how much research do you put into a, a book? A lot. Um, sometimes I'm able to travel to locations to get firsthand information, um, and sometimes I, I do it through uh, the Internet or books. Um, yeah, if you look at my, my bookmarks for, for when I'm researching a story, I'll have hundreds and hundreds of uh, uh, links that I've researched. Um, because with with books like the ones that Clive and I do, there's a lot of history that's involved. There are exotic locations all over the world that you've got to research and get the details right. Um, there's a lot of technology, uh, up, you know, state of the art technology that we use in the book. So uh, we do a lot of research with that. And uh, so yeah, it, it, it's amazing how much is in my and in my own books. I put it afterwards, at the end of the book talking about what's real and what's fiction in the uh, in the story and um, it's amazing how little I have to actually make up I think I think people tend to be surprised at the stuff that actually exists in the stories so so for example um, there's uh, in in the uh, the latest book with Clyde the Emperor's Revenge there's uh, a uh, a railgun that's on a ship railgun is a hypervelocity um, projectile weapon that um, shoots uh, projectiles at over um, Mach 7. And so wow. it's a kinetic energy weapon. And um, I, I don't, I didn't make that up at all. In fact, they're, they're planning to put one on a Navy ship this year. Wow. So, um, you know, it, it sounds like science fiction, but but it's actually, you know, being developed right now. So I, I just kind of try to t- see where technology is going in the next year or two, try to anticipate that. Now, like in the midst of this, do you ever find that the, the research can, can slow the momentum of, of the writing? Do you ever run into that sort of a situation? In the momentum of the writing itself or the story? Um, uh, yeah, I guess of the story or... Or, or both. <laughs> yeah. So my my philosophy is, and I think Clive's is as well, is that never let uh, reality get in the way of a good story. Okay. 
So if, you know, th- there will be things that, that we include in the stories that aren't actually technically possible or the locations have been changed somewhat to accommodate the story or we'll just make up some places. Um, so I think the important thing for the story is to, for, for the research is to, um, make it as close to reality as possible, um, but then change things to make the story exciting. So, so to me, the story is, is the winner. If okay. it's, if it's story, story versus reality, story wins. For sure. For sure. Now, what about the, like it distracting you from, uh, from writing? Like, is there ever like a time where you, you're doing so much research that it sort of gets you pulled away from, from the story and you kind of have to reinsert? Oh, yeah. There's all things, all yeah. kinds of things that distract from writing. And yeah, you can, yeah. you can get way too in, into the research and, and, uh, you, you, and, and the, the, um, you know, a lot of people want to try to put all their research into the story. And so, um, you know, one of the, one of the things you have to do is, um, remember that the, the research serves the story and not the other way around. And so, you know, there's, there's lots more research that I do that you'll never see in the story because it's not important. I think it's cool, but it's not important or it slows the story down or, uh, doesn't make sense for the plot, and so um, yeah, I pr- I probably only include ten percent of the research I actually do. Um, so, but you got to pick and choose what's the really important stuff to include. For um, sure. So yeah, you can really get down a rabbit hole with uh, with all the research and and forget to actually write the story. For sure, there is a. Uh a couple of uh, what almost seem like like predictions in, in your writing um you know the ark uh, there's the oil rig off the coast of uh newfoundland um which uh later get sort of gets mimicked in, in life and then in the catalyst um the process of making diamonds um yeah wh- what do you think when that happens when you know you see something later on and like whoa that was my book well, I think it comes back to trying to anticipate where technology is going, um, and uh, you know, seeing the possibilities. And you know, some some of it is kind of out there, and I was like, oh well, you know, this this won't happen. But <laughs> yeah, with the with the diamonds, I I did that story back in the mid '90s, and uh, and afterwards, yeah, the news came out. Oh, here's the way to make diamonds, and it was pretty much the way that I have put in the book. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's happened multiple times. Um, for example, I wrote a book called Grow of Wave about, um, a series of mega tsunamis heading towards Hawaii. And literally two months after the book came out, the Japan tsunami happened. Wow. And so we got actual, it was really the first time we got video of what a tsunami looked like. And it was a lot of what I described in the book. Um, in fact, in the book, I had a, uh, the main character uh, uh, survive one of the tsunamis by scuba diving, by getting scuba equipment before the tsunami hit. And uh, and uh, a, a after the Japanese tsunami happened, I read that there was actually a Japanese scuba diver who swam through the tsunami to try to find his wife. Wow. And, and a lot of people say, oh, come on, scuba diving? <laughs> You know, tsunami that does, that's crazy, but this guy actually did it. And so there's, there's been a lot of things like that that, uh, have come up after the book has come out. So it is a little weird sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Well, um, I guess that's, that's pretty much it. Is there any, uh, books or any, any projects that you want to, you know, give a, a pump to? Um, well, The Emperor's Revenge is the one that just, came out with Clive a couple of months ago and uh, we hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Congratulations. Very, very exciting. Um, and now I'm just working on the next one. Next Oregon Files book with Clive. Very, very cool. Okay. So anyways, um, uh, I just want to thank our, our guest, uh, Boyd Morrison, for being on the show. Boyd, it was an absolute honor to have you on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you.
Hey guys, thank you for tuning into the Ozzy Osbourne Radio Show. For more episodes, you can check out OzzyOsbourne.com. That's A U S S I E Osbourne.com. God bless.